And uh, can we move to the next presentation by Dr. Marta Dominic Delmas? And uh, uh, she's already there. So she's a tree ring scientist with uh, 20 years of experience studying wood in the cultural heritage. And uh, she has uh, worked in several international multidisciplinary projects. And uh, she has led four of them as principal investigator. That's really great. And uh, she has been a guest researcher at the uh, Risk Museum and the Amsterdam School for Historical Studies. Uh, she's also a postdoctoral research associate at the Autonomous University of Barcelona. So basically, uh, it's going to be a very, very interesting talk. Uh, because she's going to combine woodworking features, tree rings, DNA, and radiocarbon to reveal the production time and place of uh, historical uh, foot cuff from the Risk Museum collections. And uh, mm -hmm. we really welcome you, madam. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Sangeeta, you Professor Gupta. The floor is thank all you yours. Very much. Thank you very much. Well, as you can see, I, I actually shortened the title a little bit <laughs> <laughs> yeah. because uh, basically what I want to present is this uh, stepwise uh, multidisciplinary approach to, to elucidate the, the date and provenance of historic wooden objects in general. So here we, we are using a, a, a foot cuff as case study. But this is uh, an approach that I want you to be aware of uh, because it can be implemented in other um, wooden objects. And uh, this is, of course, uh, teamwork, the result of teamwork. So I'm going to present on behalf of all my colleagues here, Hilke Schroeder, uh, Margot Kautem, Stephanie Arcangel, Paul Van Down, Hans Pina, uh, Hilke from Germany, and um, the Tunen Institute of Forest Genetics, and the rest of my co-authors are from the Netherlands as well. So, well, this object, uh, this food cup, was donated to the Rijksmuseum in 2019. And uh, the only documentary evidence uh, uh, regarding its provenance was, uh, well, that it came from, uh, the, uh, from um, uh, Zeeland, the province of Zeeland in the Netherlands. So this is the most uh, southwestern province in the country. And... Uh, we didn't know much about it. Eh? So uh, I'm gonna show you a bit how it's made. So it consists of uh, two main logs. I'm gonna call them logs and, um, and then two, two supports. So everything is made of oak. Then of course the chains and so are made of uh, uh, iron and um, it's all made of oak. And uh, as you can see, the, the supports have less tree rings the main logs in one of them, the pith is present. On the other one, it isn't. And the the rain pattern suggests that, that this was quite deformed. Eh? We also have a main branch here, but there in the log two. And the, the supports are nailed to one of the logs. So in the museum, the, the, um, it's been displayed on this position, but Actually, the the original display position or the the uh, the position while in use would be uh, uh, flat, so being supported on those two smaller beams. And so this object was donated to the Rijksmuseum on the occasion of the slavery exhibition that the museum planned for 2020. Uh, in the end, due to COVID, uh, it was opened in uh, in May 2021. And it featured prominently on this exhibition about uh, Dutch colonial past and, uh, and slavery. And uh, actually nowadays, currently, is uh, being displayed on the slavery exhibition at the United Nations headquarters in New York. So the exhibition will run until 30 of March. And um, well, as I said, we didn't know anything about the history of this object. So um, basically the, the donor uh, inherited from uh, his grandfather or something who, who, had, who had it in a barn in, in Zeeland. And, uh, and then he decided to start some research to find out where this object may be coming from. So his research somehow took him to Brazil. We, we really 
don't know anything farther how, why he ended up there, but he went to Brazil visiting uh, former plantations, uh, Dutch plantations, uh, where, where in one, one of them has been turned into, into a museum also. And there he found this type of uh, well, similar foot calves. I'm calling them foot calves, but actually I heard from uh, English colleagues that the, the proper term is... Uh, stocks foot footstock or foot stocks so but i will keep on calling it foot calf uh, just for, for 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 the sake of consistency so there he found uh, you can see this uh, one one of the objects also unfortunately i don't know what species uh, it is made of and uh, and also these uh, um, uh, en engravings uh, or uh, paintings uh, with um, uh, drawings right? <clears throat> in which you can see how it was being used. So then uh, I started also looking for parallels and uh, just browsing the internet, for instance, uh, I found this one in the Museo de la Santa Inquisición de Lima in Peru. Uh, also, uh, it's being displayed in the vertical, like the one in Brazil. Uh, but in Spain, we found... Uh, this uh, this one so on the top right hand side <clears throat> you can see uh, is the former prison uh, former prison dungeon of a uh, of a town hall in, in a small village in, in a rural area in spain mazaleon and as you can see this is the display um, as as ours would have been placed the, the one from the Rijksmuseum museum would have been placed so flat or is also placed horizontally and, uh, and there is also an interesting painting from um, a renowned Spanish painter from Goya, uh, in which you can see the woman is also uh, standing, or and there is one such foot calf holding her her ankles. So so we we can see that th these are quite. I mean, there are numerous examples uh, all over the place, also in 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 Asia and. Uh, yeah, in Central America, uh, either related to to um, uh, to the Spanish Inquisition or to slavery, indeed, or or indeed just uh, just uh, in 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 prisons. <clears throat> so, uh, well, we wanted to find out that this was a prominent object uh, for this exhibition, and it is indeed for the for for the history of slavery. If it represents uh, uh, slavery, is being used for that. So we wanted to know where and when was this foot calf made? That was the first question. And also if it was related to, to slavery somehow could have been related. So uh, we took on this research uh, following a stepwise approach. Basically, the first thing that we did was the observation of woodworking features to see what the manufacture process uh, could have been. Um, then we used endochronology to try and find out the date and the provenance of the wood. And I'm gonna advance you now that dendrochronology did not provide that information. Therefore, we had to resort to other techniques. So we use DNA sequencing to uh, try and figure out the continental origin to start with. I mean, this could have technically been made in the American Northeast, for example, or in Europe, or I mean, the 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 these uh, white oak species are are widespread, and uh, and lastly we use uh, radiocarbon. We attempted radiocarbon wiggle matching to find the date. <clears throat> so the observation of woodworking features was very revealing. Uh, we found splitting marks in in one of the logs, uh, which indicated that the 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 I don't know, that log at least had been split from the main stem of the tree. Then we also found single bevel broad axe marks. And these are very interesting because uh, these type of axes are usually used on fresh wood. And the next uh, sequence in, 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 the, in, the product, in the manufacture process was the saw. We found hand saw marks on both uh, outer sides of the, of the, of the logs. And uh, uh, some were horizontal, like this one's quite irregular, uh, which could be uh, the result of uh, using a double threshold sewing system. 
And we also found this uh, triangular, uh, triangular so curve joint scar, as, as they are technically called, which are the result of using a single threshold and then sewing first from one side and then from the other side, and then where they meet, you get this uh, triangle. And then we also saw so the, the next step in the in the manufacture process is of course uh, leveling and smoothening the the surfaces. And we found these very interesting atze marks, and they are very interesting because the uh, the, the the blade of the atze was dented, so we can find the same little uh, stripe of wood on all over the the all the elements of the foot calf, which indicates that it was made by the same tool, so very likely at the same time. Or and lastly, we also found uh, compass marks to delineate the circles and uh, pencil lines also to, to indicate in both logs where they should be aligned. And, uh, and some marks on the inner part, you know, first they made a cut and then they started removing they removed the, the wood to create the holes. And the, the initial, what should have been perfect semicircles are now semi-ellipses, which also indicates that the wood was processed in fresh and, and shrunk uh, a bit after, um, after being done. So all these uh, things put together um, tell us that the foot calf was made in fresh, likely shortly after cutting the tree. So that was the first step. And uh, then we moved on to dendrochronology. And uh, well, ideally, I would have liked to uh, take a uh, course eh, with, with a hollow border, like the one we use for, for buildings, for historic buildings, but that was not desirable. Therefore, given the some um, surfaces, transverse surfaces were exposed at the end of the of the logs, I decided to do the research there non-invasively. So using photography and measuring the trimmings in the photographs. But mind you that here the the I had to measure the rings along this edge, for instance. Eh? So so this is a, an obliquous angle. And uh, although the measurements, um, so the, the tree rings measured there don't give you the, the, the real ring with the real value, the magnification is higher because of that distortion, it's still possible to measure them. And, and, and it's also good for cross-dating as long as the year-to-year the -year variation is preserved. So this, has, this is the result of uh, measuring on both logs. Uh, as you can see, the initial part of the curves is very consistent, almost yeah, identical in this part. And then it goes separating. Eh? The, the orange one has a higher magnitude or amplitude, and that is due to this measuring on that obliquous angle. But all in all, the goodness of fit actually made me decide or conclude that actually these two logs are originating from the same tree. So then I, I, I merge these two uh, measurements, these two tree ring series, and run them with all the uh, uh, chronologies available for white oak. I also con con contacted with my uh, North American colleagues who have um, this type of chronologies, but nothing dated. I mean, uh, so I could not date this series by dendrochronology. However, just having found out that both logs belong to the same tree was a very interesting piece of information, as you will see. So we resorted to DNA genetics, eh? so DNA analysis next to find out in the continental origin to start with. And um, well, uh, two decades ago, like uh, in the early 2000s, uh, Remy Petit in France led this um, um, mega study to identify the refugia and post-glacial colonization routes of European white oaks based on chloroplast DNA. And they defined these uh, uh, clusters of provenance, okay? So, which can be used to identify the origin uh, of oak in Europe based on, on DNA. And also more recently, Hilke Schroeder, co-author of mine in this presentation, this paper, 
um, uh, develop molecular markers uh, to determine the dental origin of white oaks. Eh? So it can be divided between North America, Europe, and Asia. <clears throat> so this is where we started. And uh, well, first of all, I have to say that the DNA analysis in wood is, is, is quite a challenge. Eh? I mean, uh, Hilke likes me to stress this because uh, um, uh, wood is a dead material. Eh? So the DNA is steadily degrading. Even when the subwood turns into hardwood, then the DNA starts already degrading. Therefore, when the tree is cut, this degradation continues and so on and so forth. And, and especially depending on the environment where, where the wood or the timber is standing, the degradation happens faster or slower. So it's uh, uh, always they re the DNA they retrieve has a poor quality and is always very low quantity. And of course, they always have to avoid contamination. So, so it is not an easy procedure. And uh, well, I collected some of the samples. Um, I mean, I collected the samples in three different places. So in one place where there was only subwood, in another one, there was subwood, hardwood, and uh, the third sample on the second log had only hardwood. The results were very interesting. So for one of the samples, uh, Hilke and her team uh, could um, identify two markers. And uh, the result was that they matched perfectly with the reference of the uh, European data set. Therefore, we already have a continental um, <clears throat> origin. And now within Europe, we were also quite lucky because it was also possible to identify haplotypes and um, they identified the haplotype one, which is basically this one that spans quite a huge transect from Southern to Northern uh, Europe. But well, we did have a, 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 an area within Europe. Therefore we could use subwood statistics from that area to, to estimate the felling date of the tree. But first we needed a date. So we resorted to radiocarbon wiggle matching. And uh, well, with radiocarbon, with radiocarbon, we are always told that uh, radiocarbon doesn't work in recent centuries, right? And um, well, and, and, and that is so, but I thought, well, we have here 147 tree rings, almost 150. So depending where we are chronologically, it could be possible to, to, to date it. And in 2001, uh, Bron Ramsey and others uh, published this approach, no wiggle matching radio, radiocarbon dates, which basically consists on taking different samples uh, at known intervals or at known distance, there the number of tree rings between them is known. And then, um, place them on the, on the radiocarbon curve like this. So they're fitting them on the wiggles of the curve with those known intervals. So this is what we did. And uh, we collected four samples from one of the stems, the one that had subwood. And, uh, and of course, we also counted the number of rings from the third sample until the outermost subwood ring. And with this, we could model the radiocarbon, the individual radiocarbon dates into uh, this uh, to obtain the date uh, of the last ring present in the wood. And because we know now the uh, provenance in Central Europe, Central, Southern, Northern Europe, well, there are very good subwood statistics for Germany. So we could use those subwood statistics to know how many subwood rings we were uh, missing till the last. Uh, ring. And we could model the felling date of the tree. Uh, so the tree was cut between 1791 and 1824 with a likely uh, um, uh, period in the early 1800s. So to conclude, <clears throat> we know that uh, the uh, this footcap was made shortly after cutting the tree, probably in a small town of a rural area which in principle would exclude um, the timber trade before processing of the wood. 
So the location could have been Italy or the Pyrenees, Eastern France, Belgium, Germany, or even farther north in Denmark or Sweden. The tree was cut in the first years of the 19th century. Uh, we know that slavery was still practiced until at least the 1830s in the colonies of most European countries. Therefore, technically, it could have been used for slavery. The production in a rural area suggests the use in a common prison, or that's what I'm inclined to believe. And further research is, ne is needed to elucidate the life of the object. Of course, this approach can be used on other uh, wooden objects, and I want to thank you for your attention. Already, it's time for the next uh, topic. So uh, if there are any questions, you can just pass it on to Dr. Mata, and uh, she'll be more than happy to uh, reply to you all people.